Good morning, Jesus Image Church. How are we this morning? Amen, amen. Can we just look at the Lord this morning? Oh, Jesus. This is a holy, holy morning. Would you just tell Him you love Him this morning? Would you just look directly at Jesus, the face of Jesus? Oh, Lord, we love You. We love You, Jesus. We love You. Just tell Him you love Him. Just tell Him you love Him. Just tell Him you love Him. This morning, we're gonna go straight up and offer Him something costly, amen? In Psalms 24, it says, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. He is the King of glory. He is the King of glory. Lord, we lift up a shout of praise, Lord. Lord, walk in this room this morning. You are the King of glory. This is your house, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus.
sing again. I bless your name. You are my all in all. Sing that verse again. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again.
you were condemned And I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again And I'm forgiven Because you were forsaken
joy to honor you. Amazing love, amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you.
You alone deserve all the honor. You alone deserve our worship. You deserve our worship. You deserve our thanks. You deserve our praise. You deserve our praise. You deserve our praise. You deserve our praise. You deserve our praise, Lord. You deserve our praise.
sing that again. Stand and sing that again. Sing your own song to the Lord. Come on, all over the room. Just adore Him. Jesus said, from your innermost being would flow rivers of living water. Just worship Him in spirit. a little more. Come on, pour your love out on the Lord.
lift our hands in his presence this morning. Father, thank you for the privilege of being invited into your presence, into the throne of grace with boldness because of the blood of Jesus. And so, Lord, this morning as a church family, we collectively thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Oh, I pray that would just well up in your hearts this morning, in reality, not as a religious dead statement, but Lord Jesus, thank you for your holy, precious blood that you poured out. Thank you that the veil was rent and torn so that we could approach the throne of grace with boldness. And we say this morning to the one who is seated on the throne, that there is no one like you, nobody, no one like you. There are none beside you. You're the one who makes your angels flames of fire like wind ministering spirits. You are the mighty one. You're the holy one of Israel. And it's our joy and honor to come this morning and give you glory, to pour our hearts out, Lord, we pray that the alabaster of our hearts this morning would break wide open and that a costly offering would flow from our hearts and that that fragrance, that precious fragrance of the Holy Spirit would fill this house, would fill our hearts and fill our lives. Teach us to love you. Teach us, I want, I want us all to agree as a church on that. Teach us to love you. Teach us to love you rightly. Let the first and great command be our absolute obsession and anoint us to minister to you and to love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we just give the Lord praise this morning? Give you all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What I'd like you to do, I just, I just sense the Holy Spirit. Uh, I sense the Holy Spirit wanting to do a very holy work right now. So what I'd like you to do is just sit down in the presence of the Lord. And Ryan is going to come and preach the gospel. And I, I want you to minimize the movement. In fact, I'm going to ask everybody just to stay in your seats unless it's an emergency. How many of you know that Jesus brought by the Holy Spirit people into this room? He knew that before they were ever born that they'd be sitting right where they are this morning to hear the glorious gospel. Now, Lord, anoint Ryan and let your word go forth in power. Draw the broken. Draw the blind. Draw the prideful, Lord, as we all were and sometimes are. Draw us all to the foot of the cross this morning. And set the cap I need your agreement here. And set the captive free. Let those in darkness come into your glorious light. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You know, we were we were singing that song, Amazing Love, earlier. How can it be? That you, my king, would come and die for me. But right after it says, I know it's true. But I believe there's some in this room that don't know that's true. That they've never experienced or never heard about this man, Christ Jesus, and never really walked into an encounter of his love that absolutely changes your life. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that and read a little bit from Scripture on what that actually looked like. That he was a real God-man that came to earth and died a brutal death. How many of you guys know Jesus just didn't die if one second to the next, it was over. Like he actually was tortured. There was actually suffering that took place. Like it wasn't just a crossing over. There was a process that led up to that. And I'm going to share a little bit about that. But I want you guys to look at Jesus, not me, not what's going on in the room, but, but look at him. In Mark chapter 15 and in verse 16, it says, the soldiers, I'm going to read out a New Living Translation because I like 
the way it was penned. It says, the soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters, called the Praetorium. And God called out, God called out the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe and they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. Then they saluted him and taunted him, hail king of the Jews. And they struck him on the head with a reed stick. They spit on him and dropped their knees and mocked and worshiped him. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put on his clothes again. And then they led him away to be crucified. That's amazing love. That a God man starting off to become a seed in a woman, but really was stripped naked, man. The Bible says they took off his clothes and clothed him two times just within this verse in front of an entire regiment of people. That God so loved the world that he would actually give his son to die, but to be suffered as well, to suffer pain, real physical pain for you and for me. And some of us in here are afraid to come to him. We're afraid to give him our entire life when he has given everything. He has given all. He's still, it's still coming to Jesus Christ that sets you free. Eternal life is secured by one way. It is still through Jesus Christ. Your sins being forgiven and made new and washed as white as snow is still through the God, man, Christ Jesus. It's him and him alone. It is by faith that we are saved. You know, there's a scripture where Jesus references in Isaiah that, they draw near to me and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. There's a scripture in Ezekiel that says that he will give us a new heart, that he'll put a new spirit within us, that he'll take that heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh, and that he will put his spirit inside of us and cause us to walk in all of his statutes. Jesus wants to grab hold of that stony heart today. Jesus wants to grab hold of that life that is subject to sin. You know, when Jesus quotes that in Matthew, he's in reference, he actually gives them a commandment about just honoring their father and their mother. All the way down to that. How many of you know we're to honor our fathers and mothers? And I know we may not have had the best mom and dad in here, but the Lord sees it all. And I pray there's many of you in this room that you may have the conversation, you may come in and sing every week on a Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, your hearts are far from him. And you may have the language of intimacy, yet you're not intimate. That we go through the repetition of life, man, and check off all the boxes, yet all the while our heart is far from him. Jesus died so you can be close. He died for proximity. The blood of Jesus brings us into the very presence of God. So if you could just close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment. I pray you just look at him. Scripture says, though your sins may be as red as scarlet, he has washed you white as snow. That if he who sins is a slave to sin, there's, there's a slavery involved. There's a, there's a cycle that takes place that Jesus wants to rip you out of and bring you into fellowship of Father, Son, and Spirit. And if you're in here and you say, man, I have made the altar calls. I probably even said the prayer, but I've never fully surrendered and given my life to Jesus Christ and him alone. I have never given him all. I have the language, but my heart isn't there. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for those hands. And if you're in this room and you may have gone through the repetition and you know that you may have been coming to church for a while, but that heart is softened, that you, you have a heart of stone 
And you need to repent and say, man, I need you, Jesus. I need you by the Holy Spirit to soften the dead things in my life. Soften that heart that goes through the repetition but doesn't truly love you. If that's you in the room, I would like you just to quickly raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. Thank you, Jesus, for those hands. If I could have everybody stand up in the room. Father, we love you. If you raised your hand on one of those two accounts or you wish you did, I would love for you just to come down the aisle and come right up here to the front. Listen, there's no shame, no condemnation. There's those on the balcony as well that raised their hand. Just come down here. Listen, he bled and died. He was stripped naked in humility and humbled so that we can come boldly to him today. Thank you, Jesus, for those that are coming, Lord. Come on, let's just welcome them as they come up here. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you're in your seats and you feel the Holy Spirit saying you should be up here, that you should have made your way to the front. And you can feel that convicting, beautiful conviction of the Holy Spirit. I would love for you to come out as well and say, yeah, that's me. Thank you, Jesus, for every life. Father, you are good. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, he leaves the 99 for the one. The ones that truly surrender everything to him. We're gonna say a prayer together in this moment, but if you brought somebody as well, we've said it many times, come on. If you brought somebody and they may not know the Lord, we would love for you to do the work of an evangelist, as we say, and just ask them to come forward. I know these moments, man, are, we care what people think at times, we, but guess what? They're, they're not gonna be next to you when you're standing at the throne. Your friends ain't gonna be standing next to you when you stand before the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. God, you're faithful. I've done it, man. I've felt sat in my chair before and I felt I need to be up there. I have to say yes to him in this moment. I can't let this moment pass by. But let's say this prayer together as a family. Let's stretch your hands towards those that are up here. And as we say this prayer together as a family, those that are up here, I want you guys to say it directly towards the Lord. It is faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. Let's all say this together. Say, Jesus Christ, I give you my life, the entirety of my life. I believe that you were begotten of the Father, that you died a brutal death, that you ascended into the underworld, defeated hell, death, and the grave. I believe that you rose again on the third day and that you ascended to the right hand of the Father and that you're coming back to rule and reign here on the earth. Jesus, my faith is found in you. I deny myself. I pick up my cross and I follow you. I give you my past, I give you my present, and I give you my future. Today I am born again in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's thank the Lord. Father, we just thank you. Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. Bible says that all of heaven rejoices. All of heaven rejoices. Thank you, Father. These are, here's a little uh, pamphlet that we pass out every single uh, week. And there's six things in here that we give to you guys. And we, we say it every week because following Jesus looks like something. It looks like something daily. Every day we are to deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow Jesus. And number one is, part of that is that we get to spend time with the Lord every single day, okay? Every day we get to be with Jesus. He is fully given of himself. That's why I said the blood of Jesus brought us into his very own presence. And now he sees you guys pure and spotless before him without a single fault. And we get to be with him and conversate with him. And number two is that we get to read the Holy Scriptures every single day. We have this opportunity to open up true food, the living word of God that is true life to us. Man shall not live by bread alone, 
but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. David says, I have hid your word in my heart. I have placed it within me so that I may not sin against you. And number three is that we get to get baptized in water. And I know we're gonna be doing it soon here so you guys can sign up. We actually have a booth right outside in the hallway where you guys can sign up and we get to partake in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Scripture says that a, a seared conscience would be wiped away and God will give us the mind of Christ, that the dead man is cut off and we get the new man. It's beautiful. We get to partake of his death, burial, and resurrection with him. And number four is we're gonna pray this, or actually number four, get connected to a local church a body of believers, people. We, we believe in running together with those that are going after Jesus. And to get um, planted into a church that be believes the totality of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and that's led by the Holy Spirit and what they do. And number five, we're gonna pray this over every single one of you guys, is that the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit, He baptizes you into Himself the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, to be a witness unto Him. And we're gonna stretch our hands. If everybody just wants to stretch your hands towards those that are up here, and we're just gonna pray that the Holy Spirit comes and encounters them. So Jesus, you are the baptizer. John says, there's one coming after me that will baptize you, the Holy Spirit, and with fire. Father, we thank you, Jesus, for your sweet presence to come and to encounter each and every one of us in this room. Lord, don't leave us out. God, it's still not by might, not by power, but by your Spirit. We need you, Holy Spirit. The, the, the love of God will be shed abroad in the hearts of every single one that has come up here, Lord. Jesus, we pray even as they leave, God, that they will be witnesses unto you because they've witnessed the one who bled and died today. The one who hung naked on the cross, they've witnessed you, Jesus. So we thank you, Holy Spirit, in your precious, beautiful name. Amen. Amen. And the last thing, really quickly, is that we go tell others about Jesus. That we, let it be your family member, your neighbor, your coworker. Let somebody know what you guys have done this morning, fully giving your life to Jesus. Now you guys get to be an evangelist and tell others about the same God in whom you witnessed this morning. Come on, why don't we just thank Jesus for every life that has said yes to them. And we can welcome them back to their seats as a family, as those that are part of the body of Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Why don't we welcome Jess as she comes up here, guys. Our beautiful choir, you can be seated. You guys are troopers. Can we let the choir know how much we love them? They are the best. Guys, we're here. Wow. The Lord is so faithful. Okay, I better do offering before I get teary-eyed. Go to Proverbs 3. just overwhelmed by his faithfulness today. He's so good. Oh, Jesus. Go to Proverbs 3. I'm going to start reading at verse 6. It says, Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. Listen, don't be impressed with your own wisdom, how we need that. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. See, when you give God your best, he sees that as honoring him. And we need to honor Jesus with all that we have. Verse 10, then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. I love that after 
It talks about giving to the Lord. It says, don't get upset, children, when you're disciplined. See, if Jesus doesn't have your finances, he doesn't have all of your heart. I'll say that again. If he doesn't have your finances, he doesn't have all of your heart. And I've shared this before, and it's something that Michael has always said to me. You have to honor the Lord with your first fruits, but that goes far beyond giving. That's the best of your morning, the best of your worship, the best of your family time, the best of everything you have belongs to the Lord because he gave everything. Jesus held back nothing for you. He gave you his life. The Father gave his only son. And to be a Jesus people, we have to be cheerful, joyful givers. Amen? So let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we love you so much. We're overwhelmed with your goodness, Lord. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. You're so faithful, Jesus. You stay close, God, to the brokenhearted. You've given us so much, Lord, and it's our honor and joy to give you all that we have, Jesus. We don't want to hold back anything from you, God, because you gave us everything. We worship you. We bless you. We praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need an envelope, just lift your hands and hold them up, and one of our ushers will come and give you an envelope. If you're in the balcony as well, just keep your hands up, and one of the ushers will come to you. If you are watching online, we love you guys so much. Thank you for joining us all over the world. If Jesus Image has blessed you and you want to give, there's a number on your screen. If you want to do text to give in the room, you can text give to the number on your screen, and we'll be back in just a moment.
we'll know that a Jesus movement is upon us when people start coming for the sake of Jesus. And we'll know that a Jesus movement is upon us when we're more aware of Jesus than the movement. There's only salvation in Jesus. Says here, I have determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Nothing this world has to offer will ever satisfy your soul. Only Jesus will satisfy your soul. Jesus is so real. He's so near. the hero. He's the hero. Jesus is the hero. Amen. You believe that? Jesus is the hero. Can we all stand? Father, thank you for your word that his life Jesus, you said my words are spirit and they are life. So in the mighty name of Jesus, wonderful Holy Spirit, reveal the crucified and risen Lord by breaking the scriptures open and in the body and blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, Jesus 22 is, what are we, a month out? Gosh, that came fast. Well, if, how many of you have not registered yet? Anyway, you, you're, you're not going to be in trouble. How many of you have not registered? Okay, make sure you register. People are registering very quickly, and um, it is going to be a very special and holy time. I'm sure most of you know, but we are going to be celebrating communion the final night which I would imagine has to be, I'm getting a little feedback here, guys, just a little buzz. I think it's in my ear or it's in one of these wedges. Oh, is it that? Yeah, it's over there. Oh, it's the fan. No, there you go, Jose. Let Jose know you love him. Got his fancy new uh, glasses. Looks so slick. We're going to be receiving communion the final night, and I think it's got to be one of the largest communion services in the history of our city, I would imagine. And then following communion, we're going to worship and ask the Lord that final night for a mass outpouring of the Holy Spirit. How many of you want a fresh anointing from the Holy Spirit? I do. Oh, I do. Well, it's wild that we're here. And by the way, you can just go to Jesus22.tv or scan that QR code. It's wild that we're here this morning. Um, Gosh, can we just thank the Lord? I don't even know what to say. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, come on. Thank you, Lord. Uh, what an honor. Thank you, Jesus. What a story. He is... Um, what a... <laughs> only God could write such a script. I was telling... By the way, Francis Chan's here with us this morning. Just love Francis. We love you. And uh, he, um, he sent me a text. He's like, I'm, I'm at church. And we thought he was resting. And uh, he said, I'm coming to be blessed. I said, perfect. I'm going to preach in perfect Mandarin. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he said, really? Can you do that? Um, it's such an honor to have you here, Francis. We love you and your family here. We so honor your devotion to Jesus, your pure and holy pursuit of the Lord, and it's marking a generation. And thank you. Thank you for doing it um, with a crystal clear focus and with integrity and for loving your family. It's a beautiful, beautiful testimony. So we're honored to have you. Yeah, so privileged. Um, um, well, oh, I was telling Francis earlier, I noticed myself 
worshiping, getting closer and closer to the altar during the worship moment. And I, in the middle of one of the songs, I said, this is the exact spot that I got born again. I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, who, if you would have told me uh, 33 years ago that I would be singing and pastoring uh, in the spot where I got the exact spot I got saved, I would have thought, there's no way. Isn't he a mighty God? He's just incredible. <sighs> I want to know him more. I want to know his mysteries. I want to know what he's thinking. I want to know his ways. Because God writes incredible stories with the most broken lives. And some of you this morning might feel so far from the Lord. You may feel like he's done with you and that he's done uh, taking your life and using it to glorify his name. Uh, he's not done with you. As long as your heart is soft, the Lord can do anything with you. Amen. He can redeem wasted time. Gosh, that's what happened to me. So I'm going to try my best to preach this morning. I'm just kind of stuck in wonder and awe of the Lord's goodness. But I want to continue our teaching on Jesus in the Old Testament. Is that good? So let's begin with, uh, oh gosh, it's loaded. I love the scriptures. We're going to um, receive communion at the end of service. Actually, I want to go back to Luke 24. Just for a quick review. You've heard me preach on this before, but... I was actually having a conversation with Francis in the, back, in the back regarding opening the eyes of our hearts, how the, Lord, how the Lord deals with our blindness. Now, even if you're born again, the scripture teaches that we all see through a glass dimly or darkly. So how many of you know that there's a direct correlation, according to Matthew 5, between the purity of the heart and the beholding of God? Does that make sense? The, the reason the beholding of the Lord is so vital is, number one, there's nobody else worth staring at, except your spouse, but <laughs> I'll, I'm going to keep it moving. So <laughs> it's in that beholding that Romans 8 becomes a reality. It's in that beholding that we are conformed into the image of the Lord. So maturity is not so much about time that you've been born again or your actual physical age. Maturity has more to do with your beholding of the Lord in his presence via the scriptures. And to be honest with you, breaking the body and blood of Jesus. That is the Lord's way of doing it. That's maturity. So you can have a mature 12-year-old, a more mature 12-year-old than a 60-year-old who's been born again for 40 years. I actually know them. Now, without using names, I know people whose lives were transformed in this building with me, who were who uh, were older than me. I didn't even own a Bible, I don't think, when I was brought here by my parents and family. But those people, some of them who were here, who fell into the power of God here, who were healed here, who received Jesus here, I don't see much progress in their lives, and I know them well. So they're very, very close to us. So some are kind of at that same spot in their progression in the Lord as they were that night, uh, 32, 33 years ago. So maturity is not about age. I mean, you can be old and smelly and immature. Okay? And you can be 15 and lock away with Jesus for extended periods of time and God's maturity can erupt within you. Now, now, now here, here's what I, I want to say. God's ultimate ambition for us is not so that we would have big meetings or start kingdom businesses or fill stadiums and catalyze movements. Those are peripheral and they are fruits of a natural flow that should take place. All right, now, God's ultimate ambition, according to Romans 8, is to conform us into the image of his son. Okay, are, are you getting that? Okay, so once you realize that, that is the ultimate ambition, you will begin to welcome what you once rebuked. All right? You realize that you actually need what you once dreaded. 
You'll find yourself being more quiet when in the past you would defend yourself. When you're misunderstood, you'll no longer go on a campaign to prove your character to each and every person who misunderstands you or misrepresents you because you realize you actually need what's coming your way so that you can be broken and be more like Jesus. That's the goal. Now, I'm not saying that everything that opposes us is sent by the Lord. Okay? But what I am saying is according to the word that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So when you understand that that's the goal, then you're actually going to thank the Lord in the midst of pain. You say, why are you even going there? Because pain is promised. <laughs> you can be a Jesus-loving, fiery-hearted, Bible-reading, communion-receiving, people-loving, faithful to your date nights. You can do it all. You will be persecuted and hated. It's actually a privilege, according to Jesus. Blessed are you, he said, when they revile you and persecute you and speak all types of evil against you, for my name's sake. So why does it come our way? Because we're in love with Jesus. So the reason I'm sharing this is because there is a place in the spirit when, when this... When this lands in your soul, you become a more formidable opponent against the enemy and a greater witness of the resurrected Christ, who still has wounds, by the way. It's very important we realize that. I know you've heard me say this before. He is not Thor. He is the Lamb of God. We need the tenderness of Jesus again. We're, we're oftentimes too loud. The world knows us for everything we're against, and we should be against things, but we shouldn't be known for everything we're against more than we're known for the nature of the Lamb within us. Okay, so if we're going to do one, we must be soft in heart. If we're going to uh, catalyze movements and make our voices known, we must be washing feet. That's Jesus. The narrative of the Bible, Yes, he's mentioned as the lion, but the narrative of the entire text is a lamb is coming to bleed. Genesis 3, he's going to crush the head of Satan by the bruising of his heel. Our God advances through the bruising. You, oh, Lord. God, the scripture says, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. It's actually a prophetic utterance regarding the resurrection. You understand? It's not like God just sits up and bows up in a circumstance. Uh, the, the Lord's greatness is invisible to the ways of the world because he comes as the lowly one. And because he's so lowly, the scripture says, had they known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. He went too low for the enemy's lofty vision. The enemy exalts himself. I will ascend to the hill of the north. I will be like the most high. Jesus says, I have come. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's his nature. That's greatness. The Calvary, or Calvary, I should say, is greatness. The tree is greatness. Lowliness is greatness. The humble heart of Jesus, humility, is greatness. That's why he kept the wounds. It's a reminder that this is what glory looks like. Yes, I'm shining like the sun, but I kept my wounds to remind you I'm the pierced one. And there's a vacuum. There's a vacuum in the church and a vacuum in the nation that's ready to be, feel, to ready, ready to be filled by the lamb-like ones. It's there. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> but it's there. May the Lord use us. It's like this puzzle piece that's just there for the taking. For those who'd rather bleed than scream. You know, um, I'll get another text in a moment, but I just felt the Lord lead us this way. 
the other morning I was coming out of this, uh, my sleep, like in a dream type state, and I, in the dream, uh, saw the back of the Lord standing before the Sanhedrin in his trial. And in the dream, uh, you could see that the Lord was quiet, uh, not prideful, but standing uh, strong and meek. And there was just vitriol throughout the hearts of, of you could see the, the shadows of the, the priests and the accusations. And, and the Lord just stood there. And then I heard in my heart, not audibly to the ear, but audibly to the heart in the dream, I heard this. Jesus stood silently before those judges because he knew a greater judge was in, was in the room. And they thought he was on trial on their terms. They didn't understand they were actually on trial. They were on trial on his terms. Nobody takes my life, he said. I lay it down. That's Jesus. Okay, now I'm done with that. All right, Luke 24. Road to Emmaus. We know what happened. I just, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read verses uh, 13 through, you know, 21. But the basic, what's going on basically here is there are disciples walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It's post-resurrection. Uh, Jesus shows up, and they don't know it's him because the scripture says that they had been blinded. And what you'll see here is the Lord's desire to eventually open their eyes. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you become who or what you behold. That's what the scripture teaches. We become like who we worship. How many of you want to be more like Jesus? I'm not saying you're God. Don't get me wrong. Don't misquote me. We know you're not. <laughs> we know I'm not. But the goal of the Christian life is to be like the Lord. Again, this psalmist says, they looked unto him and their faces were radiant. So we see the connection here between the eyes opening and Jesus crafting and forming his likeness in nature in us so that we become a greater and greater reflection of him. This is bridal language. This is his desire as the age comes to a close that a people would emerge who are bridal, who have picked up his fragrance like Esther in her baths, and now she comes before the king smelling like what the king enjoys. And the king loves, listen carefully, in, in this context, the king loves to see his nature in his bride. All right? So this is the issue here. Vision is vital. Our vision of the Lord. And so, in verse 28, we see that the disciples' eyes are opened. But something happens, and I don't want to read it because I don't want to get stuck here. I, uh, we... we we are, we've already gone through this. But the Lord opens their eyes in two ways. He uses two uh, methods. It's very shallow. We'll just, we'll just use that just for the sake of, 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 of the message. Two methods to alleviate their blindness. One is he opens the scriptures. Okay? Say, I need to read my Bible. All right. Now, here's the issue. If Jesus doesn't open the scriptures, the book is closed. This is so important. Anybody ever meet a mean theologian? All right. <laughs> this is how you get there. You get there when you stop realizing that it is the Lord who opens the book. He is still the only qualified book opener. All right? He is still the only one who can break the seal and open the scroll. It's what he does. He's the book opener. 
And so you can quote chapter and verse, even that carries power, but if your heart is not turned toward the Lord Jesus himself, you can actually use chapter and verse to oppose his purposes. For instance, listen carefully. You can take a position that denies with what the Bible promises and your reasoning for denying what the Bible promises is because you have a Bible. No, there's actually that thought process. I don't believe in that because I have a Bible. So you actually oppose what the Scripture teaches and use the very presence of the Scripture to justify that opposition. That's what happens when you don't realize the Scripture reveals a person and can only be opened by that person. So if you're, gonna, if you're taking notes, write this down. Jesus is my teacher. Then put a comma. Or jot or tittle, whatever you need to put there. <laughs> Jesus is my teacher who opens his word. Oh, this is, I love this stuff. To point me to himself by the Holy Spirit for the glory of the Father. So who opens the book? All right. Now, who is the book about? All right. Let's talk about two weeks ago. Uh, last week I wasn't here. Thank you for sharing me with our Dallas family. I was at Upper Room and at Create. So I heard Jesse and Pastor Benny did amazing. So thank you all for letting me do that. But let's be more clear. I want to be more clear. I know the Bible is about Jesus. We know that. According to who? Say Jesus. Jesus. All right. So we take his word regarding what his word is about. If the author tells you, the scriptures speak of me, they speak of him. <laughs> you don't get to go, well, you're getting close, Lord. You're getting hotter. No, no. <laughs> if, they, <laughs> if he says, the scriptures speak of me, that means they speak of him. What scriptures is he talking about? The law, the Psalms, and the prophets. That's the entire Old Covenant. So when he announces that in the Gospels, there were no Gospel leaflets prior to the announcement. The church needs to fall in love with the whole Bible again. Rather than, I say, rather than running from the genealogies, when you understand that it's all about Jesus, you'll be looking for him in the passages that you used to run from. And then a divine romance is birthed in your heart. You open your Bible and discover that you're actually seeking the Lord. The devil does not want you to read the Bible. He wants you to fight him with your experience. And even Jesus knew better than to do that. You may have a great resume in God. I promise you. It's not greater than the king of glory. Than the Messiah who came. And when the devil came his way, even Jesus refused to rebuke him based on his experience. As Pastor Benny said, he could have just said, did you not hear the father? Just say, I am his beloved son at the Jordan. But he didn't do that. He answered with, it is written. So the entire Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is about Jesus and the entire Old Covenant. By the way, Paul didn't even call the Old Covenant. He called them the Scriptures in 1 Corinthians 15. From Genesis to Malachi, it is all about Jesus. It's more than just a type and shadow. In my opinion, it's more. I would call it an allegory, which is actually the spiritual meaning of the text. It means that Christ Jesus was bursting forth and speaking through David in Psalm 22. They pierced my hands and feet. Speaking through David, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What, David walked through death? What's happening there? 
What is the Lord saying? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. When was that fulfilled? Was it not fulfilled at the Last Supper? When an entire city had turned on him and one of his disciples turned on him? So Jesus is not just, uh, just, in my opinion, yes, he's hidden to a degree because the layers are always being removed, but he's the point loud and clear. Don't you see him in Adam and Eve? Don't you see Adam laying down to rest, signifying Jesus laying down in the tomb, sleeping, as the early church called it, the eternal holy, or the, the holy Sabbath of the Lord, that Jesus himself is the Sabbath? And from the Lord's side, on the cross, water and blood comes to wash and purify the church and birth her in the spirit, just like Eve is born from Adam's side and someone is found who's suitable for him, who can be with him, who can look at him, who can listen to him, who can feel him, touch him, hear him. This is all a picture of the Lord's ambition for his church and his worthy son, the holy bridegroom. So Jesus opens the word in Luke 24. Just go back and read it this morning via the scriptures. He opens the scriptures, but let's be more clear because we've got to get the right Jesus. That's what's at stake right now. That's what's at stake. Who is the real Jesus here? In our generation, even in our missional movements, in our church movements, who is the real one? Because there's a lot of people representing the Lord, whether you look at the church or politics, and some of it I go, I don't know that Jesus. I'm not a, I don't know that. If, if that's the one you say is the Lord, I, I'm not rolling with you. Don't know that one. So which Jesus are we talking about? Where does Jesus start? Let me hear you. Say the cross. That's it. And in Luke 24, again, it's there. He tells the disciples who are blind, he opens the scriptures and says, ought not the Christ to have suffered and died before entering his glory? So what is the Lord's starting point? Christ crucified. Christ crucified is not a segment in the experience. The revelation of Jesus and him crucified is not a part of the timeline. Jesus starts there. And by the way, he ends there. The book of Revelation says there was a lamb who was being worshipped who had been slain. So he's the cruciform son. He's the cross-shaped God. He's the one who gives his life away. It's his nature. Christ crucified is not just something that was accomplished. It's the greatest revelation of who God is. And that's why no other God can touch him. No, no, no other religion can touch him. He's so grand, he can go so low. He doesn't have this identity crisis. Do you understand? What, 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 did, what, what did Jesus reach for? Do you remember the scripture says in John's gospel, he says, everything has been placed in my hands by the Father. Everything's been placed in my hands by the Father. You've got to read the scriptures with the Holy Spirit. What's the first thing he reaches for? The feet of the disciples to wash. He goes, everything's mine. Everything. All authority in heaven is mine. All authority on earth is mine. I saw Satan cast it down like lightning. Everything's mine. The Father has placed it all in my hands. Should I reach for kingdom and riches or for your dirty feet? I'll go for the feet. That's Jesus. That's the Lord. So number one, he points him to Christ crucified and risen via the scriptures. Okay, number two, and this is what we're going to do today, is he breaks the bread. But listen carefully. Before our greatest breakthroughs, he will give you the opportunity to go your own way. Because he is not a robotic monarch. He's the bridegroom king who loves to be loved. 
So in the road to Emmaus account, the Bible says they come to a fork in the road and Jesus says, ah, it's getting dark, you know, I'm going on. Now how many of you think the Lord of light is afraid of the dark? Uh, do you think the one who dwells in unapproachable light can't handle the sunset? What's he doing? He's wanting to be wanted. He's wanting to be wanted. You see this paralleled in Elijah and Elisha. Elijah goes, hey, Elisha, why don't you go? Go stay on the side of the Jordan. Elisha goes, no, no. As my soul liveth, I'm not leaving you. He gives him another shot. Why don't you stay back? No, I'm not leaving you. Another shot. Why don't you stay back? I'm not leaving you. Why? He knew something was at stake. And so something happens when Jesus implies that he's going on. He did this when he walked on water. Did he not? Was he not going to pass the boat? See, there's something of the kingdom. Don't think for a moment that you are irreplaceable regarding God's kingdom. God can raise up. There's always a Samuel in the shadows. There's always a Samuel, a hungry young one who maybe doesn't have it all figured out but he dwells in the secret place of the Most High. And God can take that shepherd boy and craft him and use him and teach that shepherd boy like David to learn his presence with a harp all alone on a pasture. And that's what David did. He'd, he'd play a little chord and feel the measure of God come. He'd feel the Lord's presence descend. He'd go, I like that. I feel better now. Now I have peace. I'm not afraid of bears and lions. And he'd do it again. And the Lord taught him his ways. And that's what he does with us in the secret place. The Lord always has somebody waiting because the Lord is a phenomenal king. So don't think for a second that God's purposes are about us. I've seen that happen in atmospheres like this. All over the world, I've seen it happen in atmospheres like this where God is with a people. And when God's with a people, he makes the average look really good. He makes average preachers sound like Charles Spurgeon. He makes average, not that you're average, but he can take an average worship team and they can touch the world because in his presence, he takes over and he uses weak vessels. And the devil in those moments starts to whisper lies and starts to say things like this, you brought the glory. You brought the presence. It was your pursuit. That church wouldn't make it without you. That, that missions movement wouldn't make it without you. That, that stadium could never, never be effective or fill without you. And, and the devil in those moments becomes more and more successful, causing us to believe that the kingdom isn't moving, friends. Jesus said the kingdom suffereth violence. It's a moving kingdom. There's a procession. Do you understand there's a parade there's a parade that's moving, that Jesus is leading, this holy procession. We get in line behind him. But if we fall out of step, the, the parade keeps moving. It's so important to understand that. Because the scripture says, had the disciples not stopped him on the Sea of Galilee, he was going to keep it moving. He had somewhere to go, something to do. And here the Lord tells these disciples on the road to Emmaus, uh, I'm going to go on. And they responded beautifully. And this is what the scripture says. They constrained him. Constrained him to do something. You ready? To stay. I forget my notes. I'm not going to get to them. Is that all right? Okay, no? All right. Oh, I want you to grab this one. The same heart that invites him is the same heart that causes him to stay. Now, Martha knew how to get him in. Mary knew how to keep him. 
but it's the same request. Lord, come in. Martha's journey is proof that he can come in. How many churches have you been in? As soon as you feel the presence of God, or, or moments you've been in maybe, as soon as you feel the presence of God, the leadership turns the service on a dime. And what's that indicative of? That the flow chart, maybe the guests that have been invited, the sometimes too many guests invited. You craft this itinerary and say, Lord, live in it. Live in my construct. And then here's what we need you to do. We need you to work for us. Lord, work for us. Will you, Lord, join our team? We're going to 1099 you, Lord, after this event. Really? Manifest yourself according to our construct. It starts pure, and then you start to call Uh, it's Sunday morning. I don't know if Sunday mornings. Okay. <sighs> you start to assume that you're leading the Lord without knowing you're doing that. That's what you're doing. And, and without knowing, you're saying, I am actually, in a sense, going to be the Lord of this moment. Because the word Kyrios, Lord, means the one who completely owns or is master over. So I build this structure, right? And here's what happens. It, it gets worse. The devil eventually seduces me to call that structure that I asked the Lord to work within wisdom. So I call my control wisdom. And then to deify it a little more, to make my own conscience feel better, I start to say, I do that for the sake of souls. It's for souls. Do you really think more people come to Jesus? Do uh, you didn't really believe that more people would come to Jesus if he weren't there? We say he's everywhere. I know. He's everywhere in a gathering. Even that is conditional. If two or three gather in my name, I will be there in the midst of them. That means the body of Christ has to walk in with a conscientious awareness that they have come in the name of the Lord to be with the Lord and that it is his meeting. So every gathering is not a church gathering and every church building is not a church. What is the prerequisite? What's the condition? What's the ATM code that unlocks his desire to be himself among a people? Two or three gather in my name. I am there even in the midst of them. So here, Martha brings him in, but Mary keeps him. What does that tell me about him? He will respond to the slightest invitation. Martha goes, come in. He goes, okay. <laughs> Fine. Don't you love that about him? I love that he'll enter to be with the people who don't have him all figured out. But then there's one, Mary, who sees something in him that the entire room cannot see. It's like she was ahead of her time. She sat at his feet. The Bible says, listen to the progression. She sat at his feet, step one, and heard his word. And he stayed. Presence, the awareness of his presence, and the yieldedness to hear what flows from him that is a revelation of his heart. If you listen to his word, you are listening to his heart, and he feels valued. You'll never pick up your Bible the same way. All right, that kept him. These disciples constrain him. What's the heart posture of that constraining? Don't go. There's something about you. You don't talk like ordinary people. We don't know exactly who you are. But when you showed up, things got a little different. We can't see you yet. And remember this, until, oh, listen, 
until you, we learn to value his touch, our eyes will never open to the degree they're meant to. So I'm going to give you a Bible. I'm going to give you a Bible. John the Baptist in John's gospel says, he looks out this massive crowd gathering at the Jordan. He goes, there's one standing among you. I sense his presence right now. There's one standing among you whose sandals I'm not even worthy to unloose. He will baptize you. I baptize you with water. One stands among you who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. It wasn't until the following day that John says, oh, Behold the Lamb of God. What happened first? He sensed his touch. He valued the slightest shift, the slightest move in awareness. That constrains him. So how many of you want your eyes to open to behold the Lord more consistently, more beautifully? Start to value the slightest touch. Jess will tell you, when I first started preaching, my dad asked me to preach in a certain city in Florida. I don't want to give it away because it's the only, this church is the only place I preach in that city and they'll know it's them. But my dad said, come down and preach the morning service. And I drove a certain amount of hours. <laughs> I don't want y'all to get on your maps, but well, it's going to be one of these. <laughs> and I got there and the pastor's like, you're actually going to do uh, two services this morning. And I was like, okay. Great. My dad told me one. The first service was like preaching to statues. The exact opposite of all of you. This is the easiest place in the world to preach. You guys are all like always shiny and hungry. This wasn't that. This was like, who's this young idiot? <laughs> and they were so Pentecostal that they had no Pentecost. It's one of those. All the language, the tone, you know? David's like, yeah, yeah, I totally get it. All right. It was one of those. So I preached, got off the platform, I walked in the back. I had just started preaching. And I didn't know you were supposed to turn your mic off. <laughs> but I was fresh out of the prayer closet for years. Jess will tell you, I lived in that prayer closet. I was addicted. I mean, addicted. The Lord did something in me. It was the happiest place on earth <laughs> without paying $100 admission. <laughs> It was really the happiest place on earth. And so I go in the back, I go, on a live mic that's live in the house between services. Dad, what are you thinking bringing me here? I go, this place is so dead. I couldn't understand it. I'm here talking about the one I loved and the one I had discovered and they're just like, and I was like, I don't, Please let me never see them again. I said, Dad, and you said one service. Now I'm doing two. This is like double the torture. And my dad looks at me and goes. So I look down. I just see a green light on the pack. Now I have to walk out and preach. Oh, man. I don't think I ever got to preach. I think I just like prayed and worshiped the whole time. Well, that night, Jess came down uh, with some friends and they said, uh, can you preach again tonight? And I thought, no. <laughs> and uh, can you teach on the Lord and pray for the sick? And I said, sure. And so I began to preach Jesus, pray for the sick, and then I felt like the Lord wanted to baptize people in the Holy Spirit. So I called a bunch of people forward. I said, if you're hungry for more of the Lord, come. Hopefully, you guys understand by now, being part of this church family, that I love the Word. So you know that about me. I have a high value for, for theology. I, I think it's important. I think it's at stake right now. I love to discover the Lord in, in the text. Okay, so you know that. So what I'm about to say may imply that I, I don't and that I'm just super crazy. All right, so I line everyone up and I'm praying for everyone and nothing's happening. And you could feel it. I mean, it was still dead. And so I went to walk away. I went to walk to the other side of the platform, and I heard in my heart, I literally heard the Holy Spirit say, you're praying with them for them with your right hand. 
pray with them with your left. Pray for them with your left hand. And I go, what does that have to do with anything? Do you have a chapter and verse on that one, Lord? I was like, but I was begging. I mean, I was empty. I was running on empty. And I, if he would have told me to do backflips, I would have done them. So I was like, okay. So I played it really cool. Went over to the altar, put the right hand down on the side, thinking I'm losing it. And I touched the first person with my left hand. And it was like, before that I prayed for dozens, nothing happening. When I switched to my left hand, you would have thought somebody got it snipered. Like, <laughs> boom. Start speaking in tongues, glorifying the Lord in the spirit. I'm like, whoa. And then it hits the whole front of, of the altar. Person after person, just rejoicing in the spirit, getting touched by the Lord. And so... <laughs> You know, I'm going to play it cool. And I was like, yeah, man, that, that, that worked well. <laughs> I go back to the hotel and Jess goes, I'll never forget it. She goes, hey, um, I meant to tell you when you were praying for people in the beginning when it was dead, because you can have the greatest service to people. Your wife knows if you're having a bad one. People can be rejoicing. Your wife will go, you struggled. And you know, and she's got that gift. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. It's a, such an encouragement. So, <laughs> so we get back to the hotel, and she goes, hey, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, while you were praying for people, uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, Michael should switch hands and pray with his left hand. And I hadn't told her. Sometimes these simple, childlike yieldings can carry a breakthrough that can change a person's life forever. That's the constraining I'm talking about. Whatever you do, Lord, stay with us. All right, now, when they constrain him, the Lord says, fine, I'll stay. They didn't even have to ask him twice. Now, I want the Lord to stay with us here. I want a generational abiding glory here for our children's children. So when the building's built, I don't want a glory in the bricks and mortar. I want it to be holy ground because God is there. How do we follow the Lord with such a holy, furious pursuit that the next generation steps into a deeper glory than us? We must. Now, here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. I've yet to see it happen. I've yet to see it happen. I've yet to see someone hand something over and there be a greater glory on the one who stepped in than the one who dug it out of the dirt. I don't have all the answers, but my heart will break if when the Lord is done with me, that that precious, holy, beautiful fragrance of Jesus is no longer among us. Those of you who are young in this room, you'll be old in a while, trust me. <laughs> this is where my mind is right now. I've never seen it happen, and I've known many of the greats. But when I look at the scripture, I only see one pattern. I see Joshua spending more time in the tabernacle than Moses. This is the only way, the only scriptural, foundational pattern that I can see. It's that the next generation must have more. The only way to keep what they have is by pursuing more. The only way, listen, I, I feel this so strong right now. I feel the, the precious anointing. The only way you will keep what God has done here is if you go after more. The only way to keep what you have is to go after what you don't have. Mark 4. He who has little, even what he has will be taken, and he who has much, more will be given. The only way to hear, listen, the only way to protect what God said to us is to yield to what God is saying to us. 
It's the current speaking, the current reception of his voice and presence that protects what he's spoken over my life and over your life. If you stop, oh, can I have five extra minutes? If you stop protecting like Mary did and treasuring in your heart and mulling through and meditating on, The first and great commandment, to love him with all we are, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you stop valuing what the Lord spoke to you and treasuring it in the depths of your being, and you stop writing it down, and you stop praying through it, whether you feel great or not, that's what the word ponder means when it says that Mary pondered what Gabriel said to her. She protected it. She chewed on it. That's what the word meditate means, to to chew, to partner with, to pray it through until it finds its way into your bone marrow, the substance of your spirit. The moment we stop doing that, what he spoke in the past is in jeopardy. It's the only way you keep what what he said is to go after what he's saying now. There have to be these non-negotiables, non-negotiables where you draw a line in the sand and you go, on this I don't move. I'm not moving on the cross. I'm not moving on Jesus. I'm not moving on this bloody one. I'm not moving on the glory of the resurrection. I'm not moving on the scriptures. I'm not moving on the secret place. I'm not budging. If you stop pursuing him now, you may squander all the breakthrough in the past. It's just the nature of the kingdom. Have you ever noticed when you drift from the Lord now, you forget many of the prophetic words in the past that came your way? Have you noticed that? It's because in that moment, you are living by the wayside. That's what Jesus said. It's by the wayside that the thief comes, the... The devil comes and steals the seed. It's only by the wayside. Where is the wayside? It's on the side of him who is the way. You're away. You're out of the presence of God. The wayside is just where he isn't. The way is where he is. You get on the side of that. The word God is speaking to you is in jeopardy. The presence of God is everything. It's the distinguishing factor that protects everything he ever spoke to you. The word comes to, to, to life and bears fruit when you're with him. Is this making sense? Yes. And then, after he opens the scriptures and after they constrain him, may I have the elements, babe? He breaks the bread. He does it in two ways. I know I kept you a few extra minutes, but... Welcome to the kingdom. May the church machine die. And may people who love his glory and presence just arise and become the norm. Now listen, listen, listen. As the the team is handing out communion elements, if you don't have the elements, would you just lift your hands? I'm going to ask our staff uh, and their spouses, if they're here, to come forward. If you guys would come. Come now. Francis, would you join us? You guys come up on the platform. We're going to do this together. Nathan and Kathleen, would you come as well? Dion and Ruth, come on up. Worship team, you come as well, too. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. After they constrain him, they come to the table, and the Lord breaks the bread, and then their eyes open. And just like him, in perfect Jesus fashion, he disappears. <laughs> Why? So that they would pursue him again. So this morning, we, he opened the scriptures to us. 
And now the Lord who is present, who is both, both the priest and the offering. He is the meal and the one who serves the meal, the great high priest. He will, in Jesus' name, open our eyes so that we can behold the Lord in his beauty. Amen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray over you first. Let's just prepare the cup and the, and the, and the bread. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for you or receive, and then I'm going to ask Francis, if you don't mind, Francis, to pray a blessing over the people. I think it's the Lord that Francis is here with us this first morning here. I don't know many people who are going after Jesus like Francis. It's, it's an honor for all of us to be together. And I see the Lord in it. Can we stand in his presence? This is very holy. Father, you told us that we should examine ourselves. And your word says that he who judges himself will not be judged. In this moment, Lord, we confess that our sins are many, that we fail you with our words, with our actions, our motives. Oh, purify our motives. Theo and Benny, you guys just come, come up here, come stand up here. Purify our motives. Make us more like Jesus. And so we confess. And we ask you to forgive our sin. Oh, cleanse us, Lord. Your word says that many are sick and have fallen asleep among you because they have not discerned the precious body and blood of the Lord Jesus. And we don't treat this moment as a hollow symbol. We thank you that you are present in your body and blood and that this is true food and true drink. Now, wonderful Holy Spirit, I ask that you would bless this moment, that your presence would fall as we prepare to receive the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we lift the bread. Let's lift it together just as a, as a statement. We lift the bread as one. We who are many become one in this loaf that is torn. Lord, we thank you right now for the precious body of Jesus. Your word says, Lord, I am the bread who came down and I am the bread who comes down from heaven. And as your body was torn and shredded and ripped for our healing, we all in one accord, we break the bread. Let's break it. Heal us, spirit, soul, and body today. Heal the sick. Cleanse our hearts. Make us one with you and each other. We release brothers and sisters who have offended us so that we would be released. We forgive anyone who's hurt us. Bless them in Jesus' name. Bless them, Lord. I, I want you to pray this, guys. Bless them. Bless those who have not blessed us. Bless them, Father. And may the love of God fall on them. And we pray your perfect will for their lives. We receive the precious body of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Those of you who are sick in your body, just bring that weakness to the Lord. Hallelujah. Would you take the cup? Lord, thank you for your blood, your holy blood. Your word says in Psalm 22 that your life was poured out for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And there can be no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And you said, Lord, at that table, this is my blood shed for you. 
for the remission of sin. This is the cup of the new covenant. In my blood. And thank you, Lord, that you are the cup and the drink in it. So right now, in Jesus' name, we plead the blood over our lives. We plead the blood over our hearts. We plead the blood over our households. Come on, out loud, I just want you to begin naming your family members. We plead the blood over our children, over our grandchildren, over this church, over our loved ones, Lord, over every business represented here, every missionary who's visiting, every pastor who's come for more and their families. We plead the blood over everybody watching by live stream. We plead the blood over you. Our testimony is of the blood. They overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And our testimony is of the blood that Jesus has overcome. Jesus is King. And you said as we receive this meal, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Thank you for your holy death and thank you for your blood that we now receive. In Jesus' name, amen. And after you receive, just wait there for 10 seconds in his presence, honoring what you just did. We worship you, Jesus. We thank you. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Would you just pray a blessing, Francis? Holy, holy, holy are you, God. Yes. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. God, I pray that according to the riches of your glory, that you would grant my brothers and sisters in this room to be strengthened with power by your spirit in their inner beings so that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith, that they would be rooted and grounded in love. Yes, Lord. God, that they would know What is the breadth and length and height and depth? And to know the love of Christ that surpasses comprehension. Yes. So that they may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. God, to you be glory in this church Amen. and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. 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 Let me just thank the Lord. Come on, let's just thank him. We praise you, Jesus. Tonight will be, I believe, a marking moment for this church community and our family here. I would not miss tonight for just about anything. Get here, doors open at five. It will be a very special, sacred night. Come hungry asking the Lord to touch your hearts. We love you so much. God bless you. See you. See you tonight. Everyone, Michael and Jess here. We are standing on the exact location where the headquarters for Jesus Image will be. The local church, Jesus School, uh, House of Bethany, all of that will be located right here. In fact, in the exact spot where Jesse and I are standing will be the beautiful pond in front of the sanctuary where we will most likely be holding baptism services occasionally. So we're so excited. We're right here in Seminole County off of Lake Mary Boulevard. We own this land. 
God owns this land, I should say. And the building will be right behind us. The sanctuary, the admin building, and the prayer house. And so listen, we just want to say thank you so much. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for giving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being so patient and believing with us. We're believing God that the nations will descend on this property, that they will worship Jesus, that the sick will be healed here, that the lost will be saved, that the presence and glory of God will rest here. We want that. We believe this is holy ground and that the tangible glory of Jesus will be right here on this land. And so we want to invite you to come and invite you to be a part of what God is going to do here. Yeah, we are just so very thankful for you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and support. We are truly blown away with what the Lord is doing and we cannot wait to have you here with us one day. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we're gonna show you right now. We wanna take you on a journey and show you the incredible design, detail, and vision of what will take place on this property. Our Jesus Image home will be located in the beautiful Seminole County right off of Lake Mary Boulevard. This is a thriving area filled with families, restaurants, and the beautiful amenities that this area provides. The vision of this property is simple. We want the presence of Jesus Christ to be known. We have a deep value for experiencing the Lord in His beauty and the majesty of His creation. This facility will host our local church family, Jesus School, which is our discipleship training program yearly conferences, the Bethany House of Prayer, and it will also be an outreach hub for the state and nation. There is vision behind everything. The location of the buildings, the landscaping, the water features, and of course the architectural design of the buildings themselves all speak to the beauty of the Lord. We want all who enter the property to feel as though they've entered into the peace of the presence of God. With all the stress and turmoil that people face on a daily basis, this will be a place of serenity, worship, reflection, and adoration. Rather than this feeling like a headquarters, we want this to be the house of God and a home for His people. You will notice that the structures themselves have a timeless look and design. From the stonework to the stained glass, it will feel like the house of God. The gospel will be declared from every side of the property in multiple different ways. As you pull into the new Jesus Image home, you will discover a massive parking area that will be framed by and filled with beautiful shrubbery and trees. There will be plenty of room for you and your family. A beautiful drive leads you to the sanctuary building. You will enter through a stone archway. Upon the archway, one of the foundational verses for Jesus' image will be inscribed. This verse carries the heartbeat of our lives and the construction of this house. Only one thing is needed, Luke 10, 42. Upon entering the front door to the main building, you will see a massive gathering area. It is a two-story structure. The first level will be filled with life. This will be a place to congregate with friends and family, to get your children checked into children's church, to eat, or simply enjoy a coffee around a beautiful fireplace. The first level will also house the youth room. We have a major focus on seeing this next generation love Jesus. The youth room will seat approximately 500 people. This room will also serve as the second year facility for Jesus School. Our children's rooms will be located on the first level. This will be a convenient experience for children and parents upon their arrival. Our children will receive amazing Bible teaching, a worship experience, and knowledge of the presence of the Holy Spirit for themselves. The second level of the main building will facilitate working spaces for our board of directors, our staff, and interns. This will be a great blessing for us as we move forward in wisdom as a ministry. As you know, God has graced Jesus' image with a massive reach through media. Thousands have come to Jesus, and so many have been healed and set free through our media ministry. We will have our very own production studio where we can create content and continue to stream live to the nations. 
we will release podcasts, social media content, videos, and much more. Multiplied millions have watched our media content, and we believe our creative team will flourish in this new space as they step out into this vital and anointed calling. As you walk across the main gathering space, you will discover the sanctuary. What an amazing space this will be. While we will have state-of-the-art technology in the sanctuary, the space will take you back in time, a time when churches had a sacred feel to them. You will discover beautiful stained glass behind the platform. Stained glass will line the sides of the sanctuary as well, all telling the gospel story of Jesus. There will be timeless wood beaming and stonework throughout. We long for his presence to fill this place, and it will be a home for you as well. We will seat approximately 1,500 people, yet it will not lose the personal feel that we so deeply value. The platform will be spacious with plenty of room for ministry, our worship teams, and of course, a baptismal. You will notice a round stained glass image on the back wall of the sanctuary depicting a dove in fire descending in the room. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts each time we gather as a church family. The sanctuary space will also serve Jesus School. This will house our hundreds of first year students as well as our general school sessions. These students will be missionaries to the nations of the world and to their generation. The gospel will be declared from this sanctuary space multiple times per week and people will be raised up from this place to share Jesus with the world. And may millions be saved, healed, and touched by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, for our favorite space in the property, the Bethany House of Prayer. This will be the prayer house for Jesus' image. It will be a place for adoration, silent prayer, reflecting upon the scriptures, and worship. You will notice that the house will be built upon a pond. The setting will be quaint and breathtaking. Stone and wood mark the space with warmth and a traditional look that we believe will transcend generations. We believe this will be the hub of the entire property, a place where intimacy with God and pure prayer ascend before Him. It is named the Bethany House because Bethany was the place where Jesus was loved deeply. Therefore, He rested there. Mary found the better part, and it is our prayer that all who enter will find Jesus there and fall in love with Him. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May He be adored and worshiped on this property. May His Word be taught with clarity, boldness, and love. May His gospel flood the nations, and may the generations to come find Him here. Will you stand with us? Will you pray and give toward this vision? Will you give sacrificially for the sake of Jesus and his gospel? Will you be a part of something that will outlive you for the sake of eternity? Thank you. We love you. Jesus is beautiful.